go. Clarity. That's the nothing personal word of the day. It is March 25th, 2024. Welcome to another edition of Nothing Personal. For those watching on YouTube, welcome. We're happy that you're still here today. If you're watching us on the DraftKings Network, first day, 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern, every day on the DraftKings Network. This is day one. Coca, Sarah, and I have it all ready to go. Everything's working perfectly. You see, I'm playing with the mute button, just kidding around. Welcome. Clarity. We got a lot of clarity. I spent the whole weekend getting clarity. I think that's the main thing you do when you go to Vegas is you get clarity. Watching Bruce Springsteen, having dinners, going to Bruno Mars's new lounge, the pinky ring, speaking clarity. People in the media say that all the time. We would counsel people on our team, the Miami Marlins, when players were speaking to the press or we had an issue. And believe me, issues were a plenty as team president of the Marlins. Love the word clarity. Managers by rule have to meet the media twice a day. It's a terrible rule. It's very difficult for managers to do it now, being on the other side. I love the fact that managers have to do it, but when it was my manager, they would always come and say, all right, what, what, what do we got today? And we'd have to go through the list of the different issues. And one thing a good manager says is, what do I need to provide clarity on today? Dave Roberts of the Dodgers is used to operating in a swirl of PR crap. Consistent. Going back to Bauer. And that nightmare that continues to this day as he keeps creeping up, pitching against the Yankees yesterday for a team in Mexico City, thinking that he's got a shot. But the Bauer situation is child's play compared to the Otani situation. Shohei Otani has not spoken to the media since the story broke that his interpreter, longtime interpreter, had been fired last Wednesday in Korea. Go ahead and go back to previous episodes of Nothing Personal, both Wednesday and Thursday's episodes. Staggering amounts of information that was not known then and staggering little is known now. Of course, we've had the benefit of five days worth of articles, five days worth of investigations, five days worth of speculations, five days worth of non-interrogations, five days worth of trepidation, all ending today when Dave Roberts announced that Shohei Otani will meet the media. My first reaction to reading Dave Roberts, tell me that, is sh I, I felt incredibly sorry for Shohei. And that's not an emotion I have felt during the course of this week, maybe not during the course of his career, but who are his advisors? Let's hope that he's gotten someone better than Nets. Let's hope that there is someone in his ear saying, I appreciate that the Dodgers or Roberts or somebody wants you to talk, but you're being investigated, son. And the rule number one on page one of the you're being investigated playbook is shut up. Dave Roberts went out of the way to say, Dodgers didn't ask him to talk. Don't worry, he's not a distraction. We're used to distractions, and this is not a distraction. Horse hockey. What's going on around the Dodgers is a total distraction. You can pretend it's not. When you have a player who is in danger of being suspended, who is currently being investigated by Major League Baseball, and it is your off-season free agent signing with the largest contract in the history of any contract at $700 million over 20 years, Yes, don't correct me. All the new DraftKings people, pay attention. I call it 700 over 20. It's really 700 over 10, but he only gets paid 2 million a year for 10 years and then 68 million a year for the next 10 years. Of course, he doesn't have to play in those 10 years, but he's still making 68 million a year. 
You may call it deferred comp, but I'll call it tomato. We've never dealt with a player like this worldwide stage. The face of the sport. People talk about, is Mike Trout the face of the sport? No. Is it Bryce Harper? No. Is it Jazz Chisholm? No. Who is the face? Vladimir Guerrero Jr.? No. It's Shohei Otani. Baseball did everything possible to get this to go away. And on last week's Nothing Personal, we reminded you, this will not go away. Major League Baseball will have to start an investigation. And wouldn't you know it, they announced this weekend that they are starting an investigation. They put it in a very, very funny way, knowing the people in DOI and knowing the people in the commissioner's office. Earlier today, just earlier today, this was days after this happened, only earlier today, our department of investigations began their formal process investigating the matter. And the reason why it's important to say earlier today is that yesterday there was talk of not doing an investigation. Otani is currently not under investigation, which was a premature thing to say if you're baseball. Luckily, you can cover anything you do prematurely by doing it better the next time. And the next time you say, oh, we decided earlier today. Whatever. It doesn't matter as a consequentialist, which you all know I am. MLB is investigating Otani. So if you know that you're under investigation and people are going to say, no, no, they're investigating what happened with the interpreter. No, no, no. They're investigating all of it. Just like the FBI, all of it. The IRS, all of it. Governmental authorities don't care that Otani is the face of baseball. They don't care whether the interpreter went to college at X university or Y, whether he was the interpreter for the Red Sox, Yankees, or the Samson Coca law firm. They don't care. For those of you on DraftKings Network, you may not know of Coca, although if you listen to the show, you know of Coca. Matthew Coca, our esteemed producer, he and I, until today, have really been getting after it very lean now with metal art giving us all these resources sarah we have the ability to be on DraftKings network thank god for all the help meanwhile coke is working 28 hours a day still so dave roberts has to meet the media yesterday and gets word out that otani will meet the media and he says it's the right thing to do i'm happy he's going to speak and speak to what he knows and give his thoughts on the whole situation. I think it will give us all a little bit more clarity. You have a better chance, Dave, of getting a little bit more Alexis than you do a little bit more clarity, because if Otani answers even one question, then every advisor of his and lawyer needs to be fired. Every PR, every crisis consultant, everyone, fire them all. If he gives you clarity on anything, if he says one declarative statement, I want to see some firings. Let's pretend for the sake of argument that Shohei Otani had no idea that his interpreter gambled. Okay. Let's say for the sake of argument that Otani himself never gambled. All right. Let's say for the sake of argument, the guy has so much money that he didn't know four and a half million dollars was missing. Okay. Let's say for the sake of argument that the bank who did the wire transfer from Otani's account somehow thought that ePay was Shohei. Okay. If all of those things are true, plus Otani found out for the first time about any of this when ePay, his best friend, met the team and apologized for being a gambling addict, let me stop you there. I, I can't say okay to that. I've been around Japanese players. I've been around interpreters. I've been around clubhouse meetings. Do you know how a clubhouse meeting happens? You don't just go to the board and write down a time and say 3.45 PM clubhouse meeting. It's not how it works. Meetings are called by the manager 
who tells the general manager and the team president. If the players want a players only meeting, they alert the clubhouse manager who alerts the manager and then the general manager and the team president. There is no set clubhouse meeting that would happen where nobody's aware of it. It gets noticed. It's on the board. Do you think that the interpreter gets to be the focus of a clubhouse meeting without Otani knowing who he interprets for, that the interpreter is the star of this clubhouse meeting? No chance toilet pants. Maybe the Dodgers, Andrew Friedman, Stan Kasten, maybe they called the meeting and said, oh, we've got a bad article coming out. I wonder if the royal family calls meetings every other hour. I wonder if Kim Mulkey called me. We have a meeting to talk about the fact that the Los Angeles Times and ESPN, they're going to run an article and it's not going to look good for this guy who wants to meet you now. So Ipe stands up and says, oh, I've been a bad, bad boy. And Otani's looking at him and saying, what you talking about, Ipe? And Ipe says, oh, sorry, man. I lost four and a half million dollars and I got it from you. <laughs> Thank God you got the new contract. Otani then says to people around him, not being interpreted because the interpreter is having in the meeting. So he says in English purportedly, or I don't know what language, do you think he says, oh my God, this is terrible. My best friend is a bad, bad man stealing from me. I find it all to be a little bit shocking. Wait to see. Wait to see is when I tell you something's going to happen. It could be on any subject. The thing about nothing personal that's different than the other shows you watch is that all the time when you've got people in a microphone, they say a lot of stuff. And then there's no accountability. I can be accused of being wrong plenty, and I am. But I promise you when I'm wrong, I revisit the fact that I was wrong. When I'm right, I sort of revisit that too. Wait to see. I'm going to give you one. Zero MLB updates until at least May. And no conclusion of this investigation until after October. Meanwhile, Otani will remain active. He will not be put on administrative leave. He will be active during the pendency of this investigation. But MLB, while they'd love this investigation to last, about a Robin Williams nanosecond. Nano, nano. They can't. Do you imagine MLB after Otani meets the media today? And Otani says nothing, but let's pretend he has idiotic advisors and he tells everyone the whole story and I had nothing to do with it. Never gambled, never gave money. M money was stolen from me. Boy, he sure as heck better be right. Even if he is right, you still don't say it when you're under investigation. It's, it's literally asinine. But let's pretend he says it. Do you think MLB then just says, all right, Department of Investigations, you heard it right from Shohei's mouth. Drop it. End the investigation and say, all's great here in La La Land. Oh, that's so funny. I almost choked. <laughs> I'm imagining a scenario where that could happen. Hold on. Yeah, I can't imagine it. Let me think what could be the worst case scenario. All right, I got it. Otani bet on baseball. That's the worst case scenario. There's no indication that anybody bet on baseball. There's no indication that he made any bets at all. But that would be the worst. That's a lifetime ban. Second worst would be that the interpreter bet on baseball. I'm still choking here, Coca. Are we live? Yes, we are. I never really understood what the wrong pipe was when you drink water. I'm trying to picture like two pipes. Went down the wrong way. Luckily, Metal Arc Media took care of my makeup today because we're on the DraftKings network, so you can't see the schwitz from the choke. What if he's charged with a crime while MLB is investigating? He would then be put on administrative leave. That's for sure. 
The thing is, these investigations just take a long time in the real world. MLB, they'd want to tie it up. You can't. Nothing's coming in a bow here because there's so many different angles and it involves gambling. And when anything involves gambling, and I understand that I'm saying this to you from the DraftKings network, but when anything involves gambling, the investigations run deeper because you can't get it wrong. And that's what we should all want. You all want it to be right. The downside is the distraction that Dave Roberts claim he doesn't exist. It does. That is the wait to see. What a week for baseball as we get ready for opening day this coming Thursday. Two teams have already won a game this year. You remember the Dodgers and Padres played for real in Korea. They're each one and one. But the other 28 teams start on Thursday. We would sit around so often in meetings and talk about opening day and you're all excited. Then you get the schedule and you see you're playing and you don't care because opening day, you could play Bowers team in Mexico and it doesn't matter. It's just the feeling of opening day. MLB sends the stencils. Have you ever seen the stencils that are on the field where some have opening week, some do opening day? And there's a, a logo for it, MLB opening week 2024. Your ballpark operations, people get the stencil. You get the bunting out where you store it just for special occasions within your ballpark and you hang it for opening day. Everyone's got a crisp, crisp step in their step. What's the expression, Coca? A hitch in their back, a twinkle in their eye. That's a pep in their step. Coca's right here in my right ear, whispering sweet nothings. <laughs> That's literal, actually. Everyone's got a pep in the step. In Florida, we had no tie requirement, but on opening day, you wear a tie. Just something about it. And all you want is no conflict, no distraction. Otani nightmare. How about what's going on with the union? that's taking up headlines when we should be previewing teams and games and making predictions, which we'll do later in the week, of course, overs, unders, who's going to win awards, et cetera. How about what's going on with the MLB PA major league baseball players association. Last week, we told you about the potential coup of Harry Marino and boy, did we have an update this weekend. What do you do when there's a coup? And I use that word. It's a wrong word to be used. This is not a military situation. This is a players union where the minimum salary is over 700 grand. But I digress. Angst for change at the top. Maybe we'll call it that. What do you do when you're the president of something and someone wants your job? In the real world of corporate America, you try to squish that person. You try to make that person look both bad, incompetent, not ready, not able. Tony Clark thought Harry Marino was coming for his job. Bruce Mayer knows that Harry Marino was coming for his job. So they got together this weekend and said, I've got a plan. I'm gonna get all of my constituents together. I'm going to speak to the players who I know support me, and I'm going to get the subcommittee, which is the executive council, which used to be all Boris players and now is not. I'm going to get them to do a statement on my behalf. I'm going to want the dreaded. This is so bad when you have to ask for this. I want the dreaded Pirate Roberts vote of confidence. And that's what Tony Clark got. Tony Clark said, one thing's clear. This is no longer a Harry Marino discussion in any respect. A total F you to Harry Marino, which caused Harry Marino to have to release a seven paragraph statement where he was very clear. I'm not trying to get anyone's job. I'm trying to do the job that you're all supposed to be doing. 
representing players, finding a way to take care of members of this union, trying to get unity. He ended his statement with, and always when there's a long statement, go to the first paragraph and last paragraph, because generally the stuff in the middle you can do without. It's sort of like when you're reading a word, it doesn't need to be spelled right for your brain to know what it is. There's these great TikToks and various other paragraphs. You can read a paragraph of mumbo jumbo super quickly. Your brain is an amazing thing. My sole aim is to serve the players, Harry said and concluded his statement. My sole aim is to serve the players. Do you think that's an accident? Don't think that my aim was to go get Tony Clark's job or get Meyer fired. I had one goal. I like that. I generally don't use that in statements or in conversation because that sort of bats me into a corner. And I'm not sure that I do anything with a sole aim. I'm trying to think, like in my personal life or professional life, is there an action I take where I have a sole aim? I guess when I need to find a bathroom, I've got a sole aim. Oh no, that may not even be true. I just don't like using the word. My sole aim is to serve the players and I will continue to make myself available to do so in whatever way I am asked. What a scrumptious collection of words. What he's saying is, reading between the lines, I'm not going anywhere. I'm here. If you players want to reach out to me and not tell Tony or Bruce that you're doing it, I'm available. I'll take your calls. If you all want to vote Tony out or make sure that Meyer gets fired, I'll help you do it. But I'm just going to say I'm going to make myself available. It's very hard to be aggressive and successful and supercharged and work your way to the top and wait for your phone to ring. Not sure that's actually your plan, Harry. And I dig it. It doesn't need to be your plan. I just think the statement made it your plan for no particular reason. But of course, it then required response statements. Bruce Meyer released an entire treatise, making sure that everybody was clear about what's happening here with the Players Association. He said, I believe the rivalry between agents and the demonization of players based on who their agent is presents the single biggest challenge to the union's ability to fulfill its longstanding history of unity and accomplishment. That's a letter he wrote last Thursday, trying to make sure that he wouldn't get fired. Do you know who he's talking about? He's talking about Boras. He didn't even mention his name but he's speaking directly about it. The rivalry between agents, yes, it exists. The other agents can't stand Scott. Players getting bullied for supporting Harry or bullied for supporting Scott, whether it's in the media. And then everyone wanting to teach you, the fans, that this is bad for the union. While the owners are sitting there watching this play out, praying to whatever God has time or bandwidth to pay attention to this at the moment in our country and world. That, wow, this fracture in the union is so good. It's a little early. I wish that this had happened in 2026, right around the end of the CBA. But man, this is a good start. Such a huge amount of PR crisis, CYA that's going on back-to-back -back statements, quotes. They even had, gave, made a player available for an interview with The Athletic, a Q&A with Evan Drellick, former member of the subcommittee answering questions. Where does this all end? Oh, you want me to say tears in a journey, Coca? No, this does not end in tears in a journey. This ends with way more conversation about whether Harry Marino is going to have a spot at the negotiating table when the new CBA agreements start, because Harry's not going anywhere. And no matter what you're reading Tony Clark say now, no matter what you're hearing any agent say, or Bruce Meyer, or Harry Marino himself, none of it matters. When it gets time to start choosing the shape of the table, 
where the negotiations will take place for the next CBA, we will be paying close attention to both who's at the table and who is in the ear of the people at the table. Remember, Scott Boris was never at the actual table, but he had a saving Silverman electric buzz on the nipple of every one of his players in that room. And whenever something went wrong, they got buzzed. Don't give it on that. All right, we do a segment every day called So You Want to Talk to Samson. That is when people get on Twitter at David P. Samson, or sometimes they go to davidsampsonpodcast.com where you can get all sorts of information about Nothing Personal. You can buy Nothing Personal merchandise. If you're from Philadelphia, you can please go on the website and get your tickets to a show on April 2nd, a week from tomorrow in Philadelphia, or Atlanta, Nashville, uh, Boston, New York. But I love getting questions and I love answering your questions. And we have this little ditty that we play when it's time for this segment. You know what I want? I want to talk to Samson. So you want to talk to Samson. Here's the question. It's only a few days before the season starts. Did the Orioles manipulate Holiday? What are teams doing right now to get ready? Thank you, David. I always appreciate in your questions if you say, hi, David, how you doing? Hope everything's well, because obviously it's incredibly lonely as I sit here speaking to the abyss. Thank you to the studio audience. There is a studio audience here today. Oh, no. I've got 4,000 jelly beans in front of me. All right, here we say it. The Orioles are not manipulating Holiday. And let me tell you what, what went on there. Matt Holiday's son, great player maybe the top prospect in baseball, likely could have made the team. When you've got a really good rookie, but you're coming off a 100-win season, you have no issues when you keep your rookie down. When you're coming off a bad season and you have no one to play the position that the number one prospect plays and you don't call him up, then you have to say, we want him to work on a few things. There is always a way to manipulate service time for a player. There always has been, there always will. What service time manipulation means is the fewer days that a player has on the big league roster, the longer it takes to be eligible to make any other money beside the minimum salary. That's giving you the rules in a very rough macro way. During the last CBA negotiated by Tony Clark and Bruce Meyer, really contrary to what Boris cared about, they wanted to get money to younger players faster. So they came up with several new rules that address this service time manipulation. And the way the rules are written, it's supposed to encourage teams to bring up their best players sooner so that the fans can watch them and that these great rookies can start the clock running to get to free agency and arbitration as quickly as possible. And the new rules basically talk about, hey, if you bring up Holiday in May and he wins Rookie of the Year, we're going to pretend you brought him up in April. If you bring up a pitcher who wins the Cy Young or finishes in the top for Cy Young or a position player MVP or Rookie of the Year, we are going to assume that you called them up for opening day and we're gonna give that player a full year of service time. So there will be players this year. We never know which. There will be some players who do not play a full season who will get the credit for it. But executives sit around and they say, you know what? If he earns the full year, great, but there's no reason to give him the full year without having him earn it. That is how I ran a team. That's how I would run a team. It makes absolutely perfect sense to do that. So when you're asking me, did the Orioles manipulate Holiday? Anytime you do not have your best 26 players on your roster, you're manipulating something. 
There are pitchers that we've sent down to the minor leagues who didn't break camp with us, who deserve the right to break camp. But the reason they didn't break camp is they had options left, which means we could put them in the minor leagues without losing them. There's other players who can't get sent to the minor leagues without being offered to every other team first in a waiver process. Why would we want to risk losing a pitcher when we can send down another pitcher to the minor leagues and keep both? So we manipulate that too, except the word we use is called roster management, not manipulation. The Orioles, as they start to defend their American League East crown, their 100-win season, they are dealing with the passing of their owner, designing the patch that will certainly be worn in this season. Will it be a simple PA? Ironic that Peter Angelos has the same initials as Players Association. Very, very pro-labor attorney, phenomenal attorney, represented a lot of people who got a lot of money for having a lot of bad things happen to them. Very, very difficult to work with. Very, very uncaring about what anyone thought of him. Very, very charitable. And in these last few years, very, very out of it. He was not running the team or doing anything in these last few years. He finally passed away at 94. His goal was always to keep the Orioles in Baltimore, and he accomplished that goal. His goal was to win a World Series. He did not quite accomplish that. But during his decades of owning a team, at the time in 1993, he paid the most money that had ever been paid for a team, $173 million. His sons just sold it for $1.7 billion. Rest in peace, Peter. Boy, he and I had some serious, we went at it several times. Thank you for that. So you want to talk to Samson. What are teams doing right now to get ready? I'm going to do a whole, I, I wanted to thank you for asking that question. But as we get into opening day, I'm going to do in addition to the predictions and everything else for DraftKings and for the audience, I'm going to be talking about what is going on both on and off the field as you're getting ready for opening day, because obviously it's not an ordinary day at the ballpark, no matter how badly we all want it to be. All right, let's go to break. When we come back, we're going to review a documentary I watched. Very angering and troubling. And then we're going to talk about how you stop a hit piece. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. It's David Sampson. We come to you Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. live on YouTube, 10 a.m. starting today on the DraftKings Network, which you can find on Roku, Samsung Plus, on the DraftKings app, on the DraftKings website, other points of distribution I'm positively excited about. In addition, if you're listening to us, we appreciate that too. Every day I watch a movie, no matter what, even after a weekend in Vegas, a 48 hour absolute sprint that included a total of three hours sleep over the two nights. So I maximized my time with 45 of 48. Again, shout out to the great makeup department. Love you. One of the movies I watched was a four part documentary called Quiet on the Set. Let me give you a hint. You don't know this about me unless you Google me. I'm 56 years old. During the 90s, I was in law school. Then I was in Europe. Then I was on Wall Street. Then I was in baseball. I had children in 1995, 1998, and 2003. I did not watch Nickelodeon at all. I am one of the few people who watched Quiet on the Set without having known one part of that story other than I've seen mug shots for Amanda Bynes. That's it. I didn't know Amanda Bynes had her own show on Nickelodeon. I didn't know there was a guy named Dan Schneider other than the big guy from head of the class. Didn't know he was still in the business. Never heard of 
Drake Bell. Is that his name, Coca? Had never heard of him. Had never heard of Bruce Peck. This documentary talks about the abuse that took place on the sets of the Nickelodeon kids shows. The inappropriate nature of the environment where kids were basically led into the darkness on a consistent basis by criminals. Now, I should say that I'm also an analyst on CBS. I would like to say that Nickelodeon's completely cleaned up their shop and kids are taken care of completely today. But back in the 80s and 90s, no one took care of anybody. And I knew about kid actor issues with the people from Different Strokes, with all the other child actors who end up in mug shots and drug overdoses, et cetera. There is a laundry list of people who act when they're young and don't ever get to make it as adult actors. The reason is that what is asked of these kids is not normal. While we want our kids to watch TV and watch all these shows that are produced as kids shows, and we look at kids actors, and then you do kids choice awards, and you put kids as adults in adult situations, 4869, when you put kids as kids in adult situations, nothing good happens. Do you think it's a coincidence? the number of child actors who end up doing drugs? I do not. Here's the one thing that we should be able to do for the child actors. We may not be able to stop parents from stealing from them. We may not be able to stop parents from helicoptering them. We may not be able to stop parents from being overwhelming in their lives and then the kids wanting to break away and divorce their parents. We may not be able to stop any of that because when money's involved, it's hard to deal with anything else. But I do believe that we have it in us to stop pedophilia. Call me crazy. Maybe I'm setting the bar too high for onset situations or for background checks. I don't even care if you don't do a background check about gambling when you're in sports, though you should. I don't care if you don't do a background check about where you went to college when you hire someone, but you should. I don't care if you don't do a background check about similar experience. Was he the interpreter for the Red Sox Yankees or not? Pedophilia? I feel differently about that. I watched this series infuriated. Of course, people say it was all going on. The whole Me Too movement. You Did you not know what was going on on movie sets with women for all these decades? or all of the things that happen against people of color, against minorities. Yes, it, all of it is wrong. Every bit of it. Am I wrong to say that I want children who not to be around pedophiles as my number one, number one? I'd rather have a mound of coke on set with a security guard around it. That's all I was thinking while watching it furious. You should watch it though. And if you watched the Amanda show or all of that, or all the other shows on Nickelodeon, the people I've spoken to about quiet on the set who have watched all those shows, you definitely got to watch this. All right. I'd like to talk about what it is to try to quash a story. I've gotten many calls in my years, many, many calls in my years. Hey, we're doing a story about blank. Do you have any comment? Hey, we've got this on you. We've got this on one of your players. We've got this on any somebody you know. We're going with it. Anything you want to say? Can I ask you a few questions? Sure, about what? Well, we're doing an article about blank, and we'd like to know blank. Oh, that's nice of you to ask. I'll be right back to you. I call up Samson and Coca Law speak to my PR people, and then decide what, if anything, I want to say. The women's tournament is going on in the NCAA, and it should all be about Caitlin Clark and Iowa and the numbers and the excitement and the on-field product. Women's basketball is having a moment, yet Kim Mulkey, the coach of LSU, stole the spotlight this weekend 
when she announced that the Washington Post is working on a hit piece and I'm going to sue their tuchus. If they put any false claims in there, if they defame me in any way, I'll tell you right now, I've hired the best defamation law firm, she said, and I will sue them if they publish a false story about me. She called the whole press conference to tell us that. Thank you, Kim. We really appreciate that. Let me ask you a question, though. I know you're busy coaching, and I pretty much have great respect for coaches and the allocation of time to do X's and O's. But I also know that the Washington Post didn't call you today during your game day practice and say, excuse me, you've got 90 seconds. What is it, Mission Impossible? My name is Kent Babb, and you've got 90 seconds to answer these questions. And then Ace Ventura comes out, and he pulls out a 1,000 questions that will require 18 hours of work. My piece is coming out in 12 minutes. That's not how the Washington Post works. It's absurd. And any media outlet that works that way, whatever they're writing, no one cares what it says. So she's pulling a little Shakespeare here and doth protest too much. I wonder what is coming out. I wonder what the tea will be because it's going to be spilled. Because when Kim does a press conference saying she's going to sue the Washington Post, do you know what the Washington Post does? Oh, yawn. It's just another Monday. Do you know that these places have attorneys who they consult, who check the stories, and they have fact checkers and source minders? Nah, you're right. The Washington Post has never been involved in any investigation that would require them to make sure they're getting it right. Kim's got it right. She knows. And Kim is so powerful as the coach of LSU that when they hear that she may have a problem with it, they're going to just kill the story. Nah, we don't need to do this. This is going to be too hurtful. I find it all to be rather funny, both that she thinks that she has that power and B, that she felt the need to tell us about the power that she thinks she has. When she doesn't have the power to stop the story, the story's coming out, and I got a better one for you. When the story comes out, she is going to sue him, and she's going to lose. The NCA has so much distraction now. So much distraction. Did you see just in the first round, they pulled a referee at halftime? Everything's about conflicts of interest and honesty. Please, when you're putting your resume together for all the people watching this, don't lie on your resume. The background checks that we can do that even are cursory background checks take five minutes. And teachers can check your paper for plagiarism like in three seconds. The juice is not worth the squeeze. I promise you. One of the NCAA referees doing a game did not disclose the fact that she went to the school that she was refereeing. Yikes. You're not allowed to ref a game that you're a, a graduate of. That would give the appearance of, oh, maybe there'll be favoritism. So at halftime, the NCAA figured it out. Can we talk about that for just a hot second, if you don't mind? If you know that you've gone to Chattanooga, you're asked when you are refing a game to disclose any affiliations. She forgot this referee to say, oh, I went to Chattanooga. So during the course of referee assignments, she was assigned Chattanooga. She knew her assignment because she had to get on a plane to go to the game. Don't you think she could have said, hi, my name's David Sampson. All right, I'm okay. Hi. I've got a bit of a conflict. Can you assign me to a different game? Because I got a master's degree at Chattanooga. Oh, I can't believe we missed that. All right, yeah, go to this game instead. Easy peasy. Instead, you lie on your disclosure form. You get pulled at halftime. It makes the NCAA look terrible that it took them till the half to figure out. 
it makes the referee, I would fire the referee immediately. This is not like we were asking her to split the atom. We were simply asking her to tell us what her educational experience was and any possible conflicts with any of the teams in the tournament. Not that hard. I don't like self-inflicted wounds. Self-inflicted wounds. The quick story about that is if you do something that is not within your control and it happens to you, a ball goes under your legs, it happens. Errors happen. A self-inflicted one is when you hit your hand on the dugout when you get taken out of a game and break your hand. A self-inflicted one is when you get into a motorcycle crash when you shouldn't be riding motorcycles. A self-inflicted one is when you get fired because you lied about your resume. Were you, do you lie to yourself? Do you forget where you got your master's degree? Self-inflicted. Those drive me crazy. Even more crazy, I should say, than how I am with my bracket. Did you know CBS Coca did the MPDS bracket? I had totally forgotten about that, so I didn't put my bracket in. I wouldn't be in last place in that one. I was focused on the lebitardaf.com brackets, where anyone who beats me gets put into a raffle to win a piece of memorabilia. Well, right now, out of about 4,800 entrants, I believe two of you are not beating me. But I still think I've got a shot. If in some way Kansas can beat Wisconsin in the final of the NCAA men's tournament, I believe that I will be able to move up the bracket. Is your bracket busted? Is everybody's bracket busted? People are saying, oh, I'm in first place. I got everyone right. I knew that Yale would win one game and then get crushed. I knew that Wisconsin would lose in the first round. Don't be ridiculous. Nothing personal pick of the day. We do a pick of the day every day, every show. I think starting Thursday, maybe once a week, it could get a sponsor. Maybe it'll have a sponsor every week. We're just sort of feeling each other out here together on DraftKings Network. Nothing personal pick of the day. We are 36 and 38. Our last pick was on Thursday. We had the Nuggets nine and a half over the Knicks. The Nuggets won by 13. We are only a few days from having baseball games back that we can pick. You remember we did very well in the Dodgers-Padres series. We had the Dodgers winning game one and the Padres winning game two, though the latter was not the pick of the day because of the time difference. Tonight, I'm interested in the Philadelphia 76ers and why they're getting nine points. Can someone tell me where that line comes from? I want to speak to the guy at DraftKings or the girl or the person. They're 9-0 and as dogs in their last nine. They haven't lost to the Kings since the Eisenhower administration. We are taking the points. That's my pick of the day. Pick of the day brought to you currently by David Sampson. Please, when you're hearing picks of the day, make sure you do your own research. If you want to shade my picks, shadow my picks, if you want to go with my picks, go against my picks. I encourage you to do it with independent mind, with resources that are available to you. Do not gamble irresponsibly. There is help available everywhere. I'm reading your palm and mine, just like Reese Davis had to. Can you imagine all the people giving you picks on TV and telling you, hey, this is easy money. We've got this. I can tell you what I like as a pick. Reese Davis had to apologize. A risk-free investment, I believe he said. There is nothing risk-free about gambling. That's why it's gambling. There's nothing risk-free about starting a company, investing in your own company, investing in your career. There is no benefit without a cost. There is no reward without a risk. If you don't know that, I'm not pretty sure what you do know. I cannot wait for Shohei to meet the media. Tomorrow's show, we're going to have it all for you, what he said. I would like to give you my imitation of what Shohei Otani should say today when he meets the media. It's just business. This is nothing personal.